up earlier. I believe um, when when the church when we use the church, the the word I in the church, we're what we're doing is saying collectively all together as one group as one church I. So we're it's kind of like the royal we. But it's it's bigger than that because we're all as one church saying I. So it's not, you know, me personally believing something. It's the whole church saying I believe. And this was a, a clarification that happened when the the new translation of uh, the mass came out a few years ago. And I, some people were really concerned about that and actually even upset about it. But this is a really good example of how accurate the language got in the in that new translation. So it's important to, you know, allow the church to, to do what she needs to do so that <laughs> we could all benefit from it. So when we say I, we mean all of us all together in unison saying I, I believe. When we're confirmed, we're confirmed in this creed, the, the whole creed. And this is a, a picture of someone being confirmed by a bishop, and I think it's, it's a cool picture. I like it a lot. Um, we have a, a misunderstanding in the church of what confirmation is, so I want to clarify this real quickly um, because it fits in here. Confirmation a lot of times is explained as a time when you get to um, declare your faith. And a lot of times it's even said you get to declare your faith for the first time, which is not true. You declare your faith every single time you go to Mass. And because we make the, we, we say the creed, we either say the Apostles' Creed or we say the Nicene Creed, and that is a declaration, a public declaration of faith. So confirmation is not the time when we do that. So we profess our faith literally every time we go to Mass. So I think that's something that we need to keep in the back of our mind. So try to do that. Keep that in the back of your mind. Now, when we say what a creed is, this is the thing that pops into my head, is <laughs> an Apollo Creed. Apollo Creed is not the kind of creed we're talking about. Um, it's not his son in this creed. This was actually a really good movie, I thought. I'm a big Rocky fan, for those of you who can't figure it out. Um, the, the kind of creed that we're talking about is not even a profession like what this guy is doing. The creed that we're talking about is a list of things um, because that's exactly what the, the creed is. Either one of them, the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed, it's a list of things that we believe. And we're going to, as we, as we go through this tonight, we're going to go through all 12 statements of faith, whether it's the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, there's 12 statements of faith that are made in it. So, we're going to kind of progress through this and see what happens. <laughs> this piece of uh, paper that you see up is, is called the Didache. This is actually a really tiny piece of paper. It's not much bigger than a postage stamp. Um, this is a statement of belief, uh, and we have several different copies of different parts of the Didache. The Didache is a, a document that is just basically a statement of faith. And where this originated happened in, it's actually happened in scripture in Acts 15, when that, that first council, the council of Jerusalem happens. Um, there's this, all of the, all the apostles come together and they, they pick a new person to um, take over for Judas who, who killed himself. And they clarify teachings. And that's what the Didache really is. It's a, it's a way to understand how Christians are supposed to behave. And this is actually what happened. We, we can date this all the way back to Acts chapter 15 in Scripture. So it's a really cool history that we're able to, to kind of back out. Um, the Apostles' Creed started about 100 years after the death of Jesus. And what we call it the Apostles' Creed because this is what the apostles would say that they believed. And I'm going to read this real quickly, just so that you can hear it. You can read it on the screen with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sits at the right hand of God, God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Now, that is everything that we believe. That's the official statement of what we believe as Christians. Um, people get caught up in that whole thing about descending into hell. So let me clarify that like right now. Um, what we mean by that is not the hell of damnation, but the hell of the dead, the realm of the dead. Um, there's two different ways that the, the, the realm of the dead is talked about, especially in scripture. One of them is the place where the dead are, literally the realm of the dead. And the other place is the place of eternal damnation. Um, that's called Gehenna. That's not called um, Hades. So Hades gets translated into hell very easily. So that's why hell is in the creed. Jesus doesn't go to hell, the place of damnation. He goes to hell, the realm of the dead. Um, and there, from there, he rises from the dead. So that's, that's something to keep in mind when you hear this recited or when you pray it yourself. Um, this particular creed is solidified in a, a council. A council is a, a time when all of the bishops come together and to make proclamations about, or clarifications usually, about the faith. And this was actually clarified and solidified in the, the Council of Milan. That happened in the year 390. Now, that doesn't mean that's the year that the creed was created. That's the year that it was solidified. Uh, but people had, we can trace this particular creed, the Apostles' Creed, back way into the first century of times when people were reciting it. So it's a, it's a massive tradition in the West to, to pray the Apostles' Creed. Um, later on, in about... Th as things got going in the uh, Roman, the, well, I don't want to say the Roman church, but when Rome decided it was going to become Catholic <laughs> or Christian with Con Constantine, who was the one who like, um, legalized Christianity. And uh, just kind of as an aside, the reason why Constantine did that was not because he thought Christianity was so great, but because he saw that Christianity was creating really good citizens, that pe there were people who obeyed the law, there were people who took care of each other. They, Christianity just made really good citizens. So that's the reason why Constantine um, legalized Christianity and actually made it, eventually it was the official religion of Rome, which I, which is really cool. But Constantine got, called the bishops together and he said, look, there's a lot of con con confusion about what's being taught, and I want you to, to like solidify this. So um, the, the bishops got together and they talked about lots of things in this council. Um, there were a lot of heresies going on in the, in the 300s. Um, one of them was uh, by a guy named Arius, and we're going to talk he was actually a bishop in one of the Eastern churches, and he was teaching that Jesus was not divine, uh, that he was a creator, he was a creature, uh, and people really got upset about that. So we say the word I, and we don't mean this kind of I, right? I kind of explained that. This is a little, a little animal that I think is really kind of funny looking. It's called an I I. Um, we don't even mean this kind of an I, um, because the I equals the whole church. So that's something that every single time you say the creed from this point on, try to remember that, that it's not you saying you believe, it's you agreeing with the church that the church believes the following statements. So that's an important thing also. Um, there are three different aspects or layers in the church. Um, one of them is the church militant. That's who we are. Um, and the work that we call it, the, we call the church militant, the church militant, because what we do is fight against evil all the time. And the way that we do that is through our actions and through our prayer. So we are the church militant. There is the church suffering, which is the church in purgatory. And this is, these are the, the souls in purgatory that are being purified and becoming more holy. So they're on their way to heaven. And then there's the church triumphant. Now, when we say the word I, we mean every single aspect of the church. 
It's all three of those aspects of the church. It's not just us who are going to mass. That's not the, that's not the whole church. The whole church is us, the souls in purgatory, and the souls in heaven, and along with all the angels in heaven. It's a massive thing to try to comprehend when you say, I believe, and then go through those statements. When you think about all of the things that are necessary for the word I to be said and understood. So try to keep, just absorb that and keep that in your mind the next time you hear the creed, which could be tomorrow when you watch the mass because we put it out, we're putting it up every day. Um, so let's just kind of go through this, the Nicene Creed because it's longer. Um, This started was, was, was in 300, 395, 325, sorry, um, is the, the Council of Nicaea, which is why we call it the Nicene Creed. Um, the big heresy that was going on was called Arianism. And it's not the Arianism that, they, that we think of when we hear that word, because when we think in the, you know, the modern world in the West, like us, we think Arianism means something to do with the Nazis. It did not. Um, I mean, they were Aryan, Aryan in, in their ideas, but it kind of came from this bishop in the 300s named Arius. Um, and he was just absolutely sure that Jesus was, as the Son of God, was a creature of God, that he was made by God and therefore was the greatest creature, um, which is just not true. Jesus is part of the Trinity, which makes him holy, like fully. God. And uh, that was a, a major, major thing. Um, we get this word, consubstantial, from, and we say this in the Creed now, consubstantial with the Father. We get this word because it means in the same, of the same substance. So that's part of the clarification of this new translation that happened a few years ago that makes the, the language of the Mass so much more accurate that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all one. And when we attend Mass and we participate in Mass, the whole Mass, the whole thing, is aimed toward God the Father through God the Son in God the Holy Spirit. So it's very triune, but it's also very focused on the Father. That's another thing to try to think about when you're attending a liturgy. So... There was a, a particular bishop who had a major problem with Arius, and you'll recognize him. That's this guy, St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas really is Santa Claus. And there's, I don't want to get into too much history about St. Nicholas, but this guy was very, very fervent in the faith. He, he loved the church. He loved Christ and defended him to the death. Um, well, he got word about this stuff with Arius, and it was it just made him so angry that there was one point when Arius was standing in front of all the bishops to, quote unquote, make his case. Um, he kept saying that Jesus was not divine, that he was a creature. And Nicholas got so upset that he went down in front to where um, Arius was speaking and punched him. <laughs> it's a great story. So you think about St. Nicholas. I'd like to think about him this way. Um, we think about Christmas, right? So deck the halls, try to deck the heretic. <laughs> it makes me laugh so much. And they, Nicholas was actually arrested and put in jail after that. And um, move, we moved from the council. And the bishops, like 15 of the bishops that night after Nicholas was put in jail, were all had the same dream that Nicholas had to be removed, brought back to the council. So because so many of the bishops had this un, um, same dream, they were like, well, God really wants him here. So they brought Nicholas back and they continued the council. And Nicholas, the, the Nicholas's perspective was actually the one that won. I don't know if this is going to work the way that we want to, so I'm going to try it. Ah, it didn't really. Um, so this word homoousios is a Greek word, and it really means of a similar substance. And this is what Arius was trying to was trying to say that Jesus is of a similar substance to the Father. 
What Nicholas was saying is that it's the, this homoousios of the same substance. So homoousios, the best way that we can translate that is consubstantial of the same substance. So um, there's a an idiom that we use in in our world. Um, I've used, I've heard it done, used many times. I've said it many times. Um, if you're as young as Chrissy, you don't ever hear this in your normal language because she's a pup. Um, as people say, not one iota. Have you ever, you've ever heard that phrase? Um, this is where we get that phrase, going all the way back to the 300s, because the whole faith was teetering on one iota in this language. So it's an important thing that, to think about how, how much the church has actually affected culture. And we should be affecting culture the way that it used to affect culture, and although the, the church is seeming to a lot of people to be um, less and less relevant. And I think one of the things that I, one of our, my main goals in this whole course in teaching confirmation every single year we teach it is to get people to understand how relevant the church is. It's so incredibly relevant to us. So the whole understanding of the church teetered on one iota and that echoes even today in our own language. So that's an, a cool thing to think about. Homo usias and homo usias of the same substance and of similar substance. Um, C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite Christian authors. Um, he's written so many, many books about what about Christianity. And this man was not even was not Christian at all when it when he became a professor at, at Cambridge. And he met um, two different uh, authors, also famous authors. Um, one of them is um, G.K. Chesterton, who is one of my heroes. Um, and St. C.S. Lewis was actually on his way to becoming Catholic, and he died before he became Catholic, which I think is kind of hard, kind of sad, but at the same time, it was really good <laughs> that he was continuing to make this intellectual movement toward this. Um, so this says, Believe in God like you believe in the sunrise, not because you can see it, but because you can see all that it touches. That's a beautiful thing to think about. Um, and this is the way that C.S. Lewis kind of approached all of his faith. It wasn't because he understood it, but he could see that it illuminated things around him. So it's a, it's a super cool way to understand the faith. Now, when we think of the word believe, we don't really hear it the way that it was meant in the in the, its original language. Um, when we hear the word believe, we think of something like an intellectual assent. Uh, belief is not an intellectual assent, and it's not enough to believe in God. Because and this is a kind of an extreme example, but Satan believes in God. I'm just going to let that soak in for a second. Satan himself believes in God. So it's not enough just to believe in God. What we need to do is be able to have enough. It's we, what we as Christians need to do is go beyond belief. I mean, beyond, yeah, beyond belief and really moving into trust. Um, the word believe in scripture is a big compound word that is translated believe, but it really what it means is obediential trust. So it's not just an intellectual assent to a point, you know, to like, yeah, I get this, I understand it. It's really willingness to be obedient to the point of trust. And that when Paul uses the word in Romans and in the um, Philippians and in um, Corinthians, he's those, that's the word he's meaning. He's meaning, the word he's using is obediential trust. So to have faith means to be willing to trust God to the point that you're obedient. Um, this cracks me up um, because I have I have this little dog. I wish I could bring her in the room, but the door is closed. Her name is Leah. I have pictures of her. This is her. She's a she's a Bichon, and she is so incredibly cute and so incredibly dumb. Um, man, this dog is stupid, <laughs> but she's so flipping cute. Um, we have lots of other pictures. This is <laughs> she looks like a stuffed animal on this one. My son put. A little nose and glasses on her and we laughed so hard about that um this is her sleeping upside down oh she's just so stupid 
this is this is one of my favorite things. I will remember this dog forever because of this picture. <laughs> This is Leia camping. This was actually one of our kids' chairs that Leia, when the kids outgrew, she just took over this chair and she she loves to sleep on this chair when we go camping. She thinks it's hers. Well, it actually is hers now. But um, Leia is a full blo full blooded uh, Bichon and she's actually extremely trainable. She does all kinds of really cute things. Um, she stands up on her hind legs and she she does this that we call beg for mercy. Um, she is she knows all kinds of tricks. So she knows probably 10 different tricks. Um, she can do a high five she, versus a shake. Um, she can do, a, one of the things that we trained her to do really early in her, her time with us was to go to her kennel. And we could be anywhere in the house and she could be anywhere in the house and we would just say, Leia, kennel. And she would hear our voice and she would go to her kennel and we would be able to put her in their kennel and you know leave the house and stuff. She was she's not that obedient anymore because she's old but <laughs> when she was younger she was so incredibly obedient and she knew so many great tricks um this dog i kid you not will pee and poop still pee and poop on command we put her outside and she looks at you like what am i supposed to do out here and <laughs> until you give her the signal to this is what you're supposed to do her six we have a specific signal for pee and a specific signal for poop and if she doesn't have to go out really badly she doesn't know why she's out there it's so funny um but it was it has worked really well for us to begin to train her uh, but she's so so cute but so so dumb but incredibly incredibly obedient um my son, my old youngest son, absolutely loves this dog. He thinks that she's the greatest thing on the planet. He sl she sleeps with him, and uh, I think that if he would learn how to be as obedient as she is, <laughs> it would be really good. My and my point behind all this, I do have a point about the obedience thing. See, we're not supposed to be obedient to the church because, for the sake of being obedient, we can do something that my dog cannot. We should be obedient for the sake of love. Leia's obedient because she knows that it's in her best interest. We are obedient because we know that it's in everybody's best interest. That's the reason why uh, obedience is such a big deal for the church. It's not because it's good for the church or it's not because it's just good for me. It's good because it's good for all of us together. And when the church makes decrees about stuff that are final, you know, like in terms of doctrine, like what we're talking about, these 12 points in the, in the creed, they're, they're for the love of virtue that we should be obedient to them, not just because we're blindly obedient to something. Because obedience is not really about the fact that you're being obedient. It's about the trust that's necessary for the obedience, and that's why we call it faith because it's obediential trust. Completely, totally different understanding than most people uh, come to when they hear the word believe. So when we say the word believe, what we mean is obediential trust for the sake of the love of virtue. That's a big thing to even think about. So I hope that tonight as you're sleeping, as you like are fading off to sleep, you think about for the love of virtue and obedience and let it keep you awake for about 10 or 15 more minutes. It's a good thing. Um, there are four marks of the church. Those four marks are, are in all the, both of the creeds. Actually, there are several different other creeds in the church, but these are the two big ones. Um, those, those marks are this, that the church is one. It's unified, that, that it's one body, uh, that it's not divided. The church is one. Uh, the church is holy. Now, by this, we don't mean that every single individual in the church is holy because we know that's a, that's not a reality. Like, I'm not holy. <laughs> I, I have holy moments, you know. Uh, I, I know that I can be holy for about 15 minutes after reconciliation, and then I blow it. So holiness is not about the individuals within the church. Holiness is about what the the idea of what the church stands for as a unity and the church herself is holy 
The word holy literally means to be set aside for a specific purpose. So when you think about what the church really is, the church as a whole is set aside for a specific purpose. She's set aside from all of societies, all of them, for a specific purpose. And that purpose is to worship God and to help other people come to the Lord and to worship God and in the way that God wants to be worshiped. So the church is literally in her, by definition, holy because of who, who she is. Um, the church is universal. That word means, the, the word Catholic literally means universal. It's everywhere and totally accessible. Um, we, as a Catholic church, are accepting of everybody, and we want everyone to be able to come to the church. The fact that, that you are being um, called right now into this sacrament is the proof that the church is universal. And that's a beautiful thing to even think about. So when we say the word Catholic, it literally means worldwide. And actually, it's bigger than that because the church is the church militant, the church suffering, and the church triumphant. It goes beyond even the physical nature of the world to talk about universality. <laughs> so the church is huge and accepting of everyone. So that's an important aspect of what we mean when we say the word Catholic. We don't mean just Roman Catholic. We mean worldwide universal. Uh, and then the church is apostolic. This is a word sometimes that people don't quite get when they hear this word. Um, apostolic literally means from the apostles. It also means in the way of the apostles. So it's kind of a double meaning, and it's it's a it's a really cool thing. I, this um, is a poster I have in my office at home, and it's a it's all of the popes going all the way back to Peter. So if you want to count them, <laughs> take a screenshot of this. Maybe you can count all the popes. But this is literally every single pope that goes from Francis all the way back to Peter, because Peter was the first pope, and we're going to talk about that at another confirmation um, class. Everything that the first century, what the apostles believed in the first century, we believe today. The church is totally, completely the same church that the apostles believed in. And the, the same things that the church, the, the apostles practice, we practice today. The church is pretty much unchanged. And that is a proof of truth. Um, the reality of what a truth is, is that which does not change. And I'll prove this to you real quickly. Um, if you believe something that you think is true, and then it changes, was it ever really true? It doesn't just cease to be true. It was never true to begin with, philosophically. So the the definition of truth, which the church claims to be the fullness of truth, has to be something that does not change, or else it would not only stop being true, it was never true to begin with. So there is only one system of belief in the entire world, in all the world religions, that claims to have the fullness of truth, and that's this one. It's the Catholic Church, because she can say that. And when you think about it, it's an actually kind of an audacious statement to make, um, to say, hey, we're the fullness of truth. We know we have it all. Um, so the church is either 100% correct about everything or 100% wrong about everything because she makes that claim. Um, that's a hard thing to kind of think through. And I hope as we go through this in the next several weeks, that is something that, that sticks in your head. And if you have questions about it, definitely ask us because that's a, a, a really good thing to try to break open, especially in the times that we're in right now because people are trying to define everything on their own and the church has to stand against that if she's true right it make it just makes sense so when we i have a big problem with the terms my truth or the term your truth because that's very relativistic and people say those things to each other right now all the time but i don't have my truth my truth might be could be anything and your truth could be anything and those things could be diametrically opposed to each other so either one of them is true and the other one is false 
Oh, they're both false, but they both cannot be true. It's an impossibility. So I hate it when people say, oh, that's true for you, but not for me. Ah, no, it's either true or it's not true. And whether you, whether you're, you understand it as true or not is a different subject. So truth is that which does not change because if it does change, it's no longer true and never was to begin with. So I'm, I'm, I'll drop that and let, <laughs> we'll just keep going. These, one of the, the first creed, the first statement of faith in the creed is this one. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. Um, I could go off on this for a long, long time, and Chrissy would attest to it. Um, this is like a whole, each one of these 12 things is like a whole talk. Um, but we believe in God. We believe that he's the father, that he's the provider, that he has providence, that he is almighty, that he can do anything, um, that he's the creator of the place where we live and he's the creator of the place where we're going to live <laughs> in eternity. So when we say that we believe in God, the father almighty creator of heaven and earth, we're saying that he is the biggest thing that can ever be thought of and the most powerful thing that can ever be thought of and the most creative power that can be thought of. And the actually even beyond that, because it goes beyond our thought. So this is a big statement that we believe in God, the Father Almighty. Um, all fatherhood comes from God, the Father. And if it wasn't for the fact that he is Father, we would not even be able to understand what fatherhood is. And if you look at the way the culture is right now, there is a massive, massive uh, battle that's going against fatherhood in lots and lots of ways. You can see fatherhood being attacked in so many different ways. Uh, one of the things I can't stand is um, in, a, in advertising right now, uh, if you look at the way that this gets put together, if there's a dad in an advertisement, dad is always a, a, a goof or he's always got, there's always something going wrong and he's, he's just a buffoon. And I, I think that's ridiculous that dad fathers get thought of this way because God is not a, a buffoon and all fatherhood comes from him. It's just one of the ways that the culture attacks the idea of fatherhood, and which makes sense because Satan controls the culture, and he wants God to be um, demeaned in lots of ways. So that's I'm going to let that go because that could be a whole long thing. Um, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and that whole thing about homoousios, he is not just the son of God, he is God. He is our Lord. And he's made of the same substance as God. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. If it wasn't for the fact that the Holy Spirit hovered over Mary and Stephanie, um, Stephanie, sorry, Chrissy. Chrissy's going to talk about that in the next, next half of this. Um, the Holy Spirit hovers over the Virgin and she becomes the vessel that God chooses to come to us, um, which is an incredible thing. And he's born of a virgin, which has never happened in history uh, in reality. I mean, it's happened in, there are some myths out there that talk about virgin births, but, um, and most of them are uh, either Greek or Roman myths. But this actually happened and we, we can look back in history and see how that happened. And the best documents that we have for that are actually scripture. And I'm going to let that go there too. Uh, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. We can historically, through scripture and through other, um, other documents that are other than scripture, know that Pontius Pilate was a real person, that he actually crucified a man called Jesus of Nazareth. And that that person, Jesus of Nazareth, died, and he was buried. And there's a church, a massive church, built over his grave right now um, in Jerusalem. It's called the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and it's actually beautiful. Um, where the, the, the stone that his body was laid on is actually still preserved. It's incredible. Uh, he descended into hell, and on the third day rose again. I kind of explained that whole thing about descending into hell. But... This is the, the crux of everything we believe. He rose again from the dead. Holy mackerel. Who else has ever risen from the dead? 
Nobody. There is no record of anybody ever in history literally rising from the dead. Um, there are some people that Jesus resurrected, but they did not have the same existence that Jesus had. When Jesus rose from the dead, his whole person was different. He rose, first of all, he wasn't raised by another person. He, was, he rose under his own power. And that's a completely different thing. And when he rose from the dead, his life was different than it was before because he never died again. Every single person in scripture that Jesus rose from the, raised from the dead, he, he was, the word is really not raised, but resuscitated. He brought them back to natural life. Jesus had a whole different kind of life, a body that could go through walls. He, he was available, be, uh, able to be seen in one, one place in one second and another place at another. Uh, he, would, he had a totally different kind of body, and his resurrection was totally different than just a resuscitation. If it was just resuscitation, then we have nothing to really hold on to, because then he would have died again at some point. Um, Jesus didn't just come back to life. He rose from the dead, which means that he defeated death completely, which gives us a whole lot of hope. Um, I just yesterday buried my dad, um, and um, we had we got little crucifixes for all of this, the grandchildren, and the gra this is the hope that we have for the fact that we will see him again, that Jesus conquered death. He didn't just come back to life. He destroyed death. And that's the thing that, that what, that, that's what this statement in this creed here means. He descended into hell. So he went to the realm of the dead and then destroyed it. And no other human being, no other person in all of history can make that claim. This is what all of Christianity is built on. And I think that we, in our culture, we think about Oh, yeah, Jesus rose from the dead, and it's not that big a thing anymore. Oh, no, this is a massive deal. Nobody has ever risen from the dead. And this is the, the cornerstone of all of our faith, of everything we believe. And we're gearing up to celebrate that in, at Easter. And that's what Easter celebration should always be about, the fact that Jesus conquered death itself. That's incredible. Um, again, I hope that's something that keeps you awake. He, descended, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Uh, in Scripture, we hear the stories of Jesus ascending into heaven, and he, which means he's still alive. He's actually life itself. So he's, he's more, than a lot, more alive than we are, for sure, and everybody who's with him in heaven is more alive than we are. And that's the thing that is so incredibly cool about our faith. Like, I am absolutely convinced that my dad, who, you know, we, we buried his body yesterday, is more alive than I am right now as I speak. He is 100% more alive than I am. And I can't wait to see him again. And because I have hope in Christ, I know that I will. Um, so Jesus is with God and is part of God, and that's why we say he sits at the right hand of the Father. From then he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Um, we believe that there is going to be a time of judgment. That judgment comes individually to all of us at, our, at the time of death. Um, but there's also going to be a part, that's called a particular judgment, but there's also going to be a general judgment for everybody, for the whole world, even people who have not died. Um, when Because he's coming back. He said he would, and Jesus is always true to his word, because he is truth itself. So when he said he's coming back, we kind of, you can hang your hat on that. He's coming back, and it's only a matter of time. But we receive our particular judgment at the time of our own death, and human beings are, um, usually before we give this talk, we also have a, a long thing about who God is. Um, so let me kind of recap that right here. Um, relax, Chrissy, I'm not going to go that long. Um, human beings are not just physical. You know, we're, we're physical and spiritual. We are a composite being. We have a body and a soul, and we're not one or the other. We're, when we have uh, a body without a soul, that is called dead. 
when we have a soul without a body, that's called a ghost. So we are we are a composite being. We're both we're spiritual and physical. We have a body and a soul, and we were created to live eternally, and we are going to live eternally in one state or another, because. When we die, we don't our, our, we don't end. We change the location, because we were created to be eternal, and we will we are eternal. Which is why I can say I know my dad is more alive than I am. Um, so, when Jesus comes to judge the living and the dead, we're either going to be fully alive in the present with God, or we're going to be fully separated from God, and that's what the creed calls death: to be separated from God. It means to be a well, if you're separated from God, you're either, so in, in eternity, you're either with God in heaven or you're separated with God in hell. And one of the ways that I like to teach this is that we only have two choices. We can either be a saint or go to hell. That's it. So if you're with God, you're a saint. And if you're without, if you're not with God, then you're a demon. So <laughs> you only have the two choices. And that choice is um, eternal and it's worked out in the time that we have on this planet. So we can either be moving closer and closer to God or further and further away from God, depending on the, the state that our heart is at at any given time. So uh, that's something that I wanted to, to bring up here since we didn't actually do that in the precursor. Um, I believe in the Holy Spirit. What we're preparing for in receiving confirmation is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was poured into us at our baptism, but it's unleashed in confirmation so the holy spirit will come to a, come, will for sure come to you in a way that is completely new and exciting in confirmation so we believe that the holy spirit is the, the third person of the godhead that he is the the personification of love between the father and the son so God the Father loves God the Son, and God the Son returns that love to God the Father, and that love becomes so real that, it beca that it's a person. And that happens, I explain it kind of in terms of time, but that happened in an eternal moment. So the Holy Spirit is literally the love that exists between the Father and the Son, and it circum circumnavigates both of them. So it's a super cool thing. When we think about the Holy Spirit, we think about um, like symbols and doves and uh, fire and all the stuff that we think of. But really what the Holy Spirit is, is the undying love between the Father and the Son, which is why we can say that Jesus can say that he is the way, the truth, and the life, because the Holy Spirit is part of who he is, because that's an undying love. Um, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. The Church universal the church militant and well i'm sorry the church eternal the church militant and the church um suffering all of that is the holy catholic church it's not just us who are going to mass <laughs> and it's not just the worldwide church that has a pope at the head it's the whole shebang the church militant the church suffering and the church triumphant i believe in the forgiveness of sins this is what happened when Jesus was crucified? He was crucified for the forgiveness of sins. And if we don't believe that our sins can be forgiven, then we have no business being Christian um, because Jesus died for that. He literally gave his life for your forgiveness. And that's something that I think that we overlook from time to time. Um, so we should be running to reconciliation on a regular basis whenever we need to. To, to have our sins forgiven because that's what Jesus, that's the whole reason that Jesus did what he did was to forgive us. And yet we stay away from um, reconciliation so often because it's uncomfortable. Yeah, and this is what happens inside of me, um, especially when, you know, it's a serious thing and I have to like confess something like maybe like for the fifth time and I, I'm like, ah, oh, can't believe I'm doing this again. And, <laughs> but what happens inside of me is that, yeah, this is uncomfortable, but nothing compared to what Jesus went through in order for me to be able to do this. So think about that and what reconciliation means in your life, because reconciliation is the crucifixion of Christ. He literally takes the brunt of all of the punishment for what we've done. 
and it makes you understand reconciliation in a totally different way. I believe in the resurrection of the body. There is going to be a time when everybody's bodies are going to be resurrected and we're going to have a body like Jesus's body that is incorruptible, that is um, clothed in light, that is um, not bound by space and time. Everybody's going to get that back. Um, I love to hear stories about people um, who've seen loved ones, where they, they, people will die and then they come back to life and they're resuscitated and they see loved ones. Um, this one particular story I, I love, um, I, I can't remember what state this was, but this was a, a young man, it was a boy that died when and he was like 12 years old and he had never met his grandmother. And when he was resuscitated, he, he was telling his mom, I saw grandma, his mom's mom. And his, she said, he, he, she, she greeted me and I knew it was her. And he, you know, the grandma had died prior to this boy, uh, I think when he was like two years old. So he never really had a memory of her. And he, she said, well, tell me what she looked like. And he said, it was kind of hard to say because she was a, a young girl, a child, a, a, a young girl, like an adolescent, a teenager, and she was an adult and she was an older woman all at the same time. And I think about the timelessness of what it means to be um, eternal, that it makes sense that he would see grandma that way. You know, he saw her in every single state that she was in, that her body was ever in. And that's a that's a really cool thing. So our bodies are going to be resurrected and they're going to be recognizable, but they're going to be incorruptible from totally completely incorruptible. And so we will have a body like Jesus. Um, scripture says that he was the the first fruits of um, all the fruit that's to come. And that's that, that is what they mean. But scripture means by that is we will we are going to have bodies like his. I believe in life everlasting. This is the idea of eternity, that this is what we're created for. Um, from the very beginning, human beings were meant to be eternal, and we're still eternal, even though we're stuck now inside of this thing that we call time, where we're separated from what it means to be eternal. Um, we're, we can only experience eternity one second at a time. And when we truly, truly understand this moment, we touch eternity in a small way. And I could go on and on about that, but I'm not going to. But we, we are supposed to be and are, in fact, everlasting. It's not the state that we currently understand ourselves in because we're stuck in time. But this is not what we were made for. We were made for something way beyond what time is. And it's very mystical and the church is not just a bunch of rules. The church is an understanding of what it means to be an everlasting being and to understand what it means to be ever, everlastingly loved and everlastingly loving. So those are the 12 points. Um, of, and this is this particular one is the Apostles' Creed, but all 12 of the points are in the uh, Nicene Creed as well. So we have to, through this understanding of who we are as Catholic Christians is that Jesus just loves you and you need to deal with it. Sometimes it feels great that he loves you and sometimes you're very con convicted about something and it doesn't feel so good. Um, we're going to break that open later on in another conversation also. So um, that's all I had and we can take a break if you want to Chrissy and come back in like 30 minutes. I'm not 30 minutes in like three minutes or something just because it's hard to sit this long for everybody. I know. So yeah, so yeah. I think we can go ahead. Can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we can go ahead and take a break, like you said. And then um, if anybody has any questions while we change the slideshow, because um, Richard, you're going to have to figure out how to get out of there. And uh, uh, that, might, that might be hard. It might take a minute or two. <laughs> so go ahead. And if you have questions for Richard while um, I'm setting up stuff too, you can ask him that. So let's meet back at like 8.07, 8.10. We'll just go up to 8.10. 8.10? Okay. Yeah. And then, um, ah, yeah. I stopped it. <laughs> Woo <-hoo! laughs> it actually worked. Okay. Now it's my job to figure out how to do things.
Group chat. Let me see if I can open this. So I do have a quick question. So okay. with this, um, with us doing the uh, video stuff, uh -huh. when we need to have our baptism stuff, paperwork. Um, and go. I would say really just, it's always going to be as soon as possible. Um, but so if you can do it, like if you can take a, like a scanned copy of it and email it to okay. me, that'll count too. Um, it'll be easier than getting it in person at this point, but if you right. want to drop it off, the office, the office will only be open till five, um, okay. until further notice. So yeah, if you want to drop it off by five, you are welcome to, but, uh, an email is totally fine. So. Awesome. I was just like, oh, how are we going to do this if it lasts longer than we're anticipating? <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to, too, is my yeah. fear. So, um, yeah, I have no idea. I'm afraid I'm gonna do things. Okay. Are you guys all still there? I don't know if I just deleted <laughs> thing. Um because I'm trying to figure your picture out. disappeared. Okay. Let's see if I'll take this now. You're back. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> I don't know why it's giving me so much trouble, but I might have just figured something out. Well, now I'm actually able to see my face too. So I'm kind of like, I'm oh. not sure what happened, but he got rid of the slides and I was there. <laughs> oh. Richard, I have no idea. It's not letting me open the thing. That's strange. Well, this is um, not. I'm going to open something place. else just to see if this works. Okay. 
because it definitely let me earlier. You want to try sharing it with me and see if I can bring it up? Yeah. Um, exit full screen. Okay, it's called Blessed Chrissy Slides. It's not letting me bring up any thing at all. Oh, wait. Well, maybe it is. Something happened. Uh, oh. Well, that's the wrong oh, that's thing. Believe, believe the unbelievable. Yeah. Please, please. Okay, so I got something to work. <laughs> I may have to close this and let's see. I'll just do that. Oh. Mm, I don't see your. Under your shared files. Mm. Well, that's not what I wanted to do. Let me close this. <laughs> and I'll try opening it another way. Okay. Okay, I see it in my files. Let me see if I can push it to the other program. That would be cat. Our screen. Nope. No, nah, it's not what I wanted to do. Files. <laughs> Google. Oh, Chrissy, I don't, I can't get to it through, <laughs> through Zoom. I can see it on my um, Google Docs, but not in Zoom. Let me try one more thing. Hey, I could try copying it into one of my files. Let's see. I'll, let me do that. Okay. I just feel like there's some of this is like dependent kind of on Is that okay with everyone? I think it's great. Okay.
So um, again, I'm going to mute everyone. If you have questions, you can type them out. Richard, if they have questions, then um, you can answer them as I'm going. You can do that too if you'd like. But yeah, you you trust my typing skills too much. Okay. <laughs> I do. Again, get out of there. My dog was drinking my hot chocolate. <laughs> okay, muting everyone. Okay, can you guys hear me? Thumbs up if you can. Yes, okay, perfect. Um, okay, so the first, like Richard's talk was kind of more about, um, it was kind of an intro to really everything that we're gonna be doing. The creed is kind of like the points that he made. Uh, we're gonna kind of be giving talks on all of those points throughout this process. Um, and so that was kind of like, you know, the first day of school is like syllabus day where you get to like learn what you're gonna learn. Um, and so that's what, kind of what, um, what the first that first talk is um this this talk today is going to be about the subject of mary um because there's a lot of controversy in the world about mary and um and what the church actually teaches about her and people will say well the church says this the church says that um and a lot of the things that people say the church says isn't actually the truth um and so what we want to kind of do today is um look at some of the like misunderstandings about who mary is and um actually see why um why we believe what we believe when, in regards to mary and then also um look at like proof of why we believe what we believe so to begin with um you're going to hear things throughout your um catholic life about mary things like um that nothing that the church believes about mary is in scripture that mary was just a regular girl there was nothing special about her that mary was a sinner um, that Mary was not assumed into heaven, that Catholics worship Mary, that Mary was not a perpetual virgin um, because Jesus had brothers, um, or that it's wrong to build statues of Mary and to honor her. And every single thing on this slide is, um, is not a correct statement. Um, and we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about why these things aren't correct statements, but um, to be honest, like we don't have time to go over every single point about Mary because that could be like a whole, you could probably get a degree just in Marian studies um, in a Catholic university if you wanted to. Um, and so it's like, there's a lot to, to look at here. And so we're not really going to necessarily um, answer all of your questions. Actually, what we might do today is kind of like get you thinking about like, what do I need to learn about Mary? What, what questions do I have? So that way, um you can work on answering them and and seek the answers and talk to richard and me and talk to father adam father chris um you know seek seek the truth out there so um the first objection that i hear a lot is that nothing that the church teaches about mary is in scripture and when i hear this like i always just kind of want to ask people like have you read scripture <laughs> because she's really all over the place um throughout scripture now there's this saying that you're going to hear from time to time that the Old Testament foreshadows the New Testament and the New Testament fulfills the Old Testament. Um, and what this means is that the Old Testament, um, if you are unfamiliar with how the Bible um, works, there's the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is everything before Jesus. Um, and then there's the New Testament that is Jesus and after um, Jesus. And then the um, some, several letters um, from some apostles. There's the book of Revelation. Um, but the Old Testament, like we can really see Jesus in the Old Testament and we can really see um, him predicted and kind of talked about in the Old Testament. Um, and the New Testament kind of fulfills the things that were predicted in the Old Testament. So they really work together um, and we can really see proof of how, um, of how they complete each other and are very necessary. So, um, sorry, again, these are, slides I use with my teens. They have workbooks um, that they have to do. And so the first question in their workbooks um, for this talk is what is the Immaculate Conception? Um, and this is a very misunderstood thing. People throw this term Immaculate Conception out around a lot. Um, what they jokingly say um, is that it means that um, Mary was, um, Mary had Jesus, uh, was the virgin birth is what is what a lot of people jokingly kind of say about this. But what we actually believe, um, what it actually means is that Mary was conceived without sin. Um, and we can actually see proof of this in scripture. If we go all the way back to the book of Genesis, um, the word Genesis means the beginning. So the book of Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Um, and in the first chapter of, Gen or in the thir first 
three chapters of Genesis, we see the creation of the world. Um, you know, you're very familiar probably with those stories. God said, let there be light and there was light um, and it was good. Um, and then we see the creation of Adam and Eve. And then we get this story. We see that Adam and Eve are created. They're told specifically um, not to eat from the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, um, uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, and Adam is told to protect the garden and to work the garden. Um, and so then we get this story here um, in Genesis 3. And it says, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. So we're talking about Mary. So like a question that you might have at this point is like, what does all this have to do with Mary? This is the story of Adam and Eve. Um, but there's, it's really important when reading scripture to really look at the whole context of everything, not to just take things, um, not to just look at like a certain couple of verses um, on their own without really understanding um, who they were written for, who they were written by, why they were written, um, you know, the type of documents that they are, um, just in the historical context, the way people would understand these things. And so when we read a passage like this, we have to really kind of pick apart um, all the things that are saying, it uses words like he and her and um, this. And so you're like, who is he and who is her and what is this that they're talking about? So we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at this passage more closely. Um, I have animations on my normal slideshow um, when it's actually working correctly um, that go with this. But um, so it might look a little funny. I'm, I apologize if it does. But it says, the, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this. So what is the this that we're talking about? Um, we're talking about the, um, causing Adam and Eve to sin. Now, it's important to understand that um, the serpent was considered the most cunning of all of God, uh, or the most cunning of creatures, right? And it actually says that in the very first line of Genesis three. Um, the serpent um, did this very tricky thing when he, when the serpent came to um, Eve to tempt her with the fruit. He didn't come to her and just say like. I don't know, like God doesn't exist, right? Because Adam and Eve knew that God exists. Like they knew that he was real. They had had encounters with him. Um, they had experienced his love. They had experienced his power. And so they knew better than if, if the serpent came to her and was just like, God's not real. She'd be like, well, yes, he is. I, I've talked to him. I've met him. Yes, he is. Um, but the serpent came to her and he asked her a question. And the question that he asked her was, did God really say, not to eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, and Eve's response at this point is very interesting because there's a couple of things that you have to really pay attention to when you're reading the story. And one of those things is that um, when God gave the command, do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, um, Eve hadn't even been created yet. Um, it, it's actually like in the timeline of the story, he creates Adam, he gives him this command, he tells him to work the garden, to protect the garden. And then he, um, he sees that it is not good for the man to be alone. And so he creates Eve at that point. Um, and so Eve never even heard this command from God. She's getting this from, you know, second, second hand. She's getting this from wherever she's getting it from. Um, probably from Adam. <laughs> but, you know, um, so the servant comes to her and says, did God really say this? And her reaction is to start to have doubt, start to have fear. Um, she starts to wonder, like, what did God really say? And so she answers in a very um, presumptuous and as assuming way by saying, um, God said, you shall not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, nor shall you even touch it. And God never said anything about touching the tree. He just said, you can't eat from the tree. Um, so she takes the fruit. Um, we don't know if it's an apple. Uh, Richard will say it's a pomegranate. Lots of people will say it's a fig. Um, but the, the Bible doesn't actually specify what kind of fruit. It just says it's a fruit. Um, that's just fun trivia, I guess. Um, but so she eats the fruit. And then there's this really poignant line that I, like, just always kind of stands out to me. It says, Eve ate the fruit and then she gave it to her husband who was with her and, she, and he ate it too. Um, and that line, he was with her really demonstrates um, the unique predicament that Eve was in at that time. Um, Eve was 
not alone. Like we think of her as being just like there to defend herself against this, this scary um, serpent, like snake-like beast. Um, you know, and we're like, oh, well, whatever. Like we, we make assumptions about the way that she reacted to that. But in, in reality, um, Adam was with her and it was his job to protect the garden and to protect everything that was in it, which includes his wife, um, Eve. And so um, Adam really dropped the ball there too. Um, and so it's really important to kind of keep that in mind throughout, throughout all of this, right? So, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done all of this, um, cursed are you above livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. So um, the serpent is punished at this point and we're told um, what is going to happen to the serpent. And I really wish my animations were working right now so you guys could see um, all this, how it unfolds. But um, I will put, it goes on to say, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Now, the word enmity um, means total and complete separation. So God is saying um, to the serpent, I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman. Now, we know at this point that he cannot be talking about Eve because, um, because she's already sinned at this point. The sin has already happened, and so she doesn't have separation from, um, from evil, from the Satan. And so it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Um, so we know we cannot be talking about Eve because um, of that. So it has to be talking about a different woman. And obviously, like you can tell, we're talking about Mary tonight. The woman that he's referring to is Mary. It goes on to say um, that he will put enmity between your offspring, so Satan's offspring, and her offspring. Who's her offspring? Um, we know it can't be Eve's offspring because Eve's offspring also has sin. Um, Eve's offspring commits the first murder in the Bible. So it can't be Eve that we're talking about here. Who, whose offspring has complete separation from Satan? Um, that would have to be Jesus because he is without sin also. So he, Jesus, will crush your head, um, Satan's head, and you, Satan, will strike his heel. Um, to the woman, he says, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe, and with painful labor you will give birth to children. So basically what he's saying here is that Mary, uh, or this woman and her offspring are going to open a can of ass against Satan, right? Um, and so this passage alone right here just proves that Mary is sinless um, because of this word enmity. Uh, it's a really important thing. Now, a lot of times we hear in scripture, or we hear people talk about like um, how Jesus is the new Adam. Um, there's a lot of similarities between Adam and Jesus, but Jesus um, really lived these things like out in a holy and perfect way um, where Adam did not. And um, if there is a new Adam, there has to be a new Eve too. And so who would the new Eve be? Well, it would have to be Mary. And we see so, so many comparisons in scripture between the old Eve, which is Eve, and the new Eve, which is Mary. For instance, the old Eve has no enmity with Satan. So the old Eve is um, sinful. The new Eve has enmity with Satan. Um, she is not sinful. It's really confusing the way that it's written with the no enmity and whatever, but um, it makes sense. The old Eve is, was created originally without original sin. So there's only a few people ever who um, never had original sin in the beginning of their life. And um, Adam and Eve were, they weren't born. So they can't say that they were born without original sin, but they were created without original sin. Um, and Mary and Jesus are the only two who do, to be born without original sin. Um, the old Eve prompted Adam to do the first evil act to, um, to eat the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. Um, and Eve prompted Jesus to do his first glorious act, which was the changing of water to wine at the wedding at Cana, which we're going to talk about that story in just a little bit. Eve was bone of bone and flesh of flesh with Adam. She was created from his rib. Um, and Mary is bone and bone and flesh of flesh with Jesus because she um, was his mother. She gave birth to him. Um, Eve was cursed for her disbelief, where Mary was blessed for her belief. Um, Eve believed a fallen angel, Satan, and brought sin and death into humanity, and Mary believed an angel and bore grace and hope for humanity. When the angel came to Mary and, um, told her she would, um, have Jesus, she believed the angel and bore grace and hope to humanity. And then Eve is the mother of all the living, that is what the word Eve actually means, and Mary, we see, um, at the end of Jesus' life. Um, at the crucifixion, we see that he gives her as the mother to the disciples living in Christ at the cross. So she becomes the mother of the living at that time. Um, 
So Mary could not have enmity with Satan and me a sinner. She would have had to be pre preserved from all sin. Um, and so this is like kind of a difficult thing for some people to understand. But when we think about it, like Jesus is the only person who's ever been able to choose who his mother was um, and to choose what she was like. And if I could have chosen my mother, of course I would have made my mom and chosen a mom without sin. Like I love my mom. She's awesome. Um, but even for her own sake, not like not in a selfish way, um, but even for her, I would want her to be without original sin. I would want her to be free from that um, and to be without that kind of burden and, and pain. Um, but Jesus did have that power. He did have the ability to choose his mom. He did have the ability to create her without original sin and have her be born without original sin. Um, and so to suggest that Jesus didn't save his own mother from original sin is like basically saying that God doesn't have the ability to save anybody from original sin. Um, and so I don't want to be like, or from sin in just in general, and I don't want to be the one to call into question his ability to save us from sin. Um, but I, I don't want you to be mis like, uh, misunderstand me. Mary did in fact have to be saved from sin. Um, she even says herself, she says, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. So she actually calls God her savior. Um, and so a lot of people will pull this verse out and say like, well, if Mary needed a savior, then she obviously had original sin. Um, but we all know that it's better to be saved from original sin before we have it than it is to be saved from it afterwards. It's better to be saved from anything before that we have it. That's why we're doing this whole quarantine thing right now is so that we can be saved from the coronavirus before we get it. Um, and so it's very real to us right now, this idea that like, we don't want to be saved after. We don't want to get sick and then be saved. We want to um, be preserved from having the sickness to begin with. Um, we see in scripture, we see um, David say, oh Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. Lord, you brought me up from Shoal. It goes on to say, you kept me from going down into the pit. It is way better to be kept from going down into the pit than it is to go down into the pit um, and then be rescued from it. So I have a couple of little um, images here or gifts, I guess, of um, this first one is gonna be of an example of what we experience. This is how we are saved from sin. We have to, we are down there, we're in the dirt, we're in the danger, we're in the, the bad situation and Jesus has to come into our world. He has to join us and be part of, um, you know, of this reality and get dirty in the muck too um, so that he can save us from the sin. So this little video, uh, oh, it started at the end. Um, this dog is kind of like what Jesus does for us, right? Like we're trapped under this house, it's dirty, it's wet. We don't really know what's going on down there. It's dark. Um, he's got to come in and save us from the sin. And that dog is just so cute and he saves him and it's so cute and I love dogs. Okay, so anyway, um, but that's kind of an example of how, of what we experience when we experience salvation. Um, we're familiar with the movie, uh, The Princess Bride and how um, she falls into the quicksand. Um, and he, what does he have to do? He has to go um, jump into the pit and go in after her and rescue her from the, from the danger, from the bad place. Um, but Mary gets a unique thing that she gets to be saved before this happens to her. Um, I love this little video right here. This dad is amazing. Like you can see him starting up there. He's still standing there. Just, you know, how fast he had to be running to go down there and save that kid. But he saved the kid before the kid got hurt, before the kid got run over. Um, we see in this video too, these are all dad saves videos of this dad who, you know, the kid, they could have saved him by taking him to the hospital or her, I think it's a girl, um, you know, and getting her stitched up and getting her cleaned up and all that. But um, he saves her before, before that even happens. Uh, same with this video, another dad saving their kid before, um, yep, sees them, goes, there we go. <laughs> um, and then this one's just kind of, I guess the kid's not really in danger in this video, but, uh, you know, just saves the ball, kid doesn't even know what's going on, just eating the bottle, like, kid's not even bothered at all. Um, and so, that's kind of how Mary was saved. Mary was saved before, um, before the pain of original sin ever even happened to her. So I'm going to be using a term throughout this um, talk called the ark. 
And when we think of arcs, we tend to think of this kind of arc. We think of Noah's Ark. And yes, this picture of Noah's Ark does have two unicorns going out of the ark. Um, and no, unicorns aren't real. But <laughs> the um, we think of this kind of arc. We think of Noah and we think of the animals. And that's correct. That is an arc. Um, the word arc is not super theological in meaning just by itself. Um, the word arc means something that carries something. So it doesn't mean like a boat or a ship or a traveling zoo cruise or anything like that. It just means something that carries something. And so the ark carried the animals, it carried Noah and his family. Um, so it just, that's what the word ark really means. So it doesn't mean anything more than that. Um, but I'm going to be using the word ark a lot. And when I use this word, I'm talking about this. This is the ark of the old covenant. Um, the ark of the old covenant was one of the most holy and precious things that the Israelite people had. Uh, we first hear about this ark in Exodus um, 25:19. And this is when he gives, God gives orders to build the ark. Um, and he gives very, very specific directions on how to build it. So it should only be made from the purest items. Um, in scripture, it actually says that it should be made of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide, and one and a half cubits high. It says, plate it inside and outside with pure gold and put a molding of gold around the top of it. Cast four gold rings and fasten them on the four supports of the ark, two rings on one side and two on the opposite side opposite side. And then it goes on and on and on and on. And if you read the book of Exodus, you're going to read, they like repeat how to make this over and over and over. And so you kind of get like really tired of hearing about how to make the ark. Um, but this ark was a very holy thing because of what it carried. It like it by itself wasn't super spectacularly holy, um, but it was holy because it carried three really, really important holy items. One of the things it carried was the stone tablets um, that had the 10 commandments on it. One of the things that it carried was the manna that God gave the Israelites as they were wandering in the desert, the bread from heaven. Um, and this fed them um, while they were wandering in the desert. And then it also carried the um, Aaron's staff, which was the symbol of the high priest. Um, and miracles happened with it. So um, the ark carried these three things. And because it carried these three holy things, it itself was holy. Um, but the, so the arcs weren't really something that was like unique to the Israelite people at the time. Um, it's something that like a lot of different cultures had. Um, they had arcs that would, um, they would take into battle with them specifically, but there was something that was different about the Israelites arc. And that is that it didn't have the queen mother sitting on it. Um, most arcs did have, have, a, you know, some kind of statue of the queen mother. So it would be taken into battle. So the people would remember what it was that they were fighting for when they got disheartened, when they lost courage, um, whatever, they could look back at the ark and say, oh yeah, that is what I'm fighting for. And the Israelites didn't have a queen mother sitting on their ark. Um, and this kind of made them like Richard Wolf say, like it made them like the laughing stock um, of the people. Um, because it was empty, you know, this is actually not an example of the ark. This is actually an example of a monstrance. Um, when we have Eucharistic adoration, that's um, the Eucharist there. Um, but it's kind of an example of what an ark might look like with uh, the queen mother sitting on it. Um, and so they didn't have a queen mother yet. So they couldn't put a woman on the throne because they didn't have the queen mother yet. And this idea of queen mother was very common um, in this time too. And it was, again, something that was really important. Um, the, um, the Hebrew word for queen mother is gibberah. I'm actually not totally sure that that's how you pronounce it, but that's how I pronounce it. Um, and this word just means queen mother. And we can see very specific examples in scripture um, of how the Gibberah was treated and what her role was like. We can see in 1 Kings 2.19 a wonderful example of this. Now, um, without going into too much detail, it's important to know some things about Bathsheba because the story is about Bathsheba. Um, she was King David's wife and the mother of King Solomon. Um, now, Solomon really liked worldly things. He liked gold. He liked um, his like, kingdom and castle. He, he really liked beauty. Um, and one of the worldly things that he liked was having a lot of women. Um, and so he had 300 wives and 700 concubines. So with that going on, um, you can imagine that it would have been really hard to pick, like, who's the queen going to be among all of these women? Women are notoriously petty and dramatic. And uh, if you had a chance for one of them to become, to, um, like, beat the other one out to be the queen, you betcha there would be fighting for that spot. Um, and it would be ugly and it would not be peaceful and it would have been really bad. So how do you pick who the queen is going to be? 
Um, and I feel like it's pretty obvious at this point, but um, it is always going to go to the role of being the mother. And um, so I want to read this little passage from First Kings, where we can see how um, Bathsheba and Solomon interact with each other. It says, um, then Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah, and the king stood up to meet her and paid her homage. Then he sat down upon his throne, and a throne was provided for the king's mother, who sat at his right. There is one small favor I would ask of you, she said. Do not refuse me. Ask it, my mother, the king said to her, for I will not refuse you. Now, I want you guys to keep, I'm going to kind of pick the story part a little bit, but I want you to keep some of these things in mind as we read the next story um, from John chapter 2. Um, Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, went to King Solomon to speak to him, and the king stood to meet her. And he paid her homage. Now, he's, there's only one person in the whole world that the king would stand for to meet and, to, and who would pay, he would pay homage to, and that was his mother. He sat down upon his throne, and a throne was provided for his king's mother. So she is obviously worthy of a throne. And she sat at his right, which was the position of the number two. Now, she speaks very boldly to him and says, there is one small favor I'd ask of you. Do not refuse me, which is, again, language that nobody else could use with the king. And his response isn't, don't talk to me like that. Who are you, lady? His response is, ask it, my mother, for I will not refuse you. Um, and so this is the way that the king would, would talk to his, um, his mother. And this was very common. Um, the queen mother was the queen. Like, she, she got what she wanted. Um, and so we're going to kind of see um, some things about Mary here. Um, when I hear people say that Mary was just a regular girl, um, I, I always want them to kind of look at this story and say, like, is this something that a regular girl would do? Is this something the way that a regular girl would um, act with Jesus? Uh, again, in the workbooks for the teens, it says, list three things that were interesting about the wedding feast at Cana. You don't have to do that, but you can if you want to. Um, so um, this story is from John 2, verses 1 through 12. And there's actually a line that's missing in here that I need to remember to to say. But it says, on the third day, a wedding, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. Nearby stood six stone jar water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. He did not realize where it had come from, for the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings up the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of his signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Okay, so again, this is a story that a lot of people like use as kind of like a joking story um, because it seems like it's not that big of a deal. And I feel like people kind of wonder like, why is this even in scripture? Like, what does this have to do with anything? Um, you know, they're, they're like, it's a story of a wedding and he changes water to wine. Like, great, what a great first miracle, right? Um, but there's so much important stuff that goes on in this story. Now, um, a lot of people will say that this is a story about a wedding because it's called the Wedding Feast at Cana. Um, but, um, in my experience, um, when I go to a wedding, the names of the bride and groom are very important parts of the wedding, right? Um, and if you notice, like, the, the bride and groom are never named. We don't even know how they are related to Jesus and Mary, like, why Jesus and Mary are at this wedding. Um, we don't even really know, um, from this story, because the story is not really about a wedding. The story is really about this miracle and this person who prompted the miracle. Um, so the weddings at this time went on for days and, um, and so this is saying on the third day, a wedding took place in the Canaan Galilee, Jesus' mother was there. So there's two people who are named in the story, um, or who are specifically mentioned in this story. One is Jesus and one is Jesus' mother. Um, and his disciples also were invited to the wedding. Um, and then we don't really hear about the disciples anymore. Um, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Now, this is a kind of an interesting thing for her to come to him and say. Notice that she's not going to Jesus and even asking him a question. She's not asking him to do anything. She, um, she just knows that he can do something. And so he go she goes to him and says, they have no more wine. And that is all she says to him about this. Now, he has a very interesting response, which is, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. 
So that is a really important part. First of all, this word woman is something that a lot of people really take, um, have a hard time with because um, it sounds like in our culture, when if you were to call a woman just woman, um, you wouldn't get a very good response from her. Um, it's not a very polite thing to call someone. Um, and so we tend to react from our 2020, um, you know, mindset of, of this word. Uh, but it was really important that he called her woman because there's another time where we hear someone referenced as woman. Um, and it's something that we talked about already today is back with Adam and Eve. When, um, when God comes to the serpent and says, like, I'm going to put enmity between you and who? Between you and the woman. Um, and so this is supposed to like trigger a thought in our minds. Like, who is this woman? Like, why, why is he calling her this? What is he saying? Well, he's referencing all the way back to that time. Um, and then he says, why do you involve me? And a lot of people, again, will hear this from like our, you know, the year 2020 and say like he was being kind of a jerk or kind of rude at this point. But I always think of it as kind of like the Southern Belle, like, you know, like little old me, like, what could I possibly do about this? Why are you coming to me? Like, okay, that was a terrible accent, but you get it. Like, uh, why, like, he knows what, he, what she's asking and he knows what he needs to do at this point. Um, Mary was very concerned because for them to run out of wine this early on in the wedding um, meant that this was going to be a very embarrassing and humiliating situation for this new couple. Um, and so she wanted to protect them from that. Um, but he says to her, he like just kind of reminds her, like, my hour has not yet come. But she doesn't do anything, um, you know, in response to that. And I think that's where I'm missing the passage. Um, let me see. Yeah, so Jesus, or Mary, the next thing Mary says is not like a whiny thing, it's not a complaining thing, it's not a demanding thing, it's not like a, um, you know, like naggy kind of thing. Um, what she actually says next, and I don't have it written there, is um, she goes to the servants and just tells them, do whatever he tells you to do. Um, and these are the last words that we hear Mary speak in all of scripture, are the words, do whatever he tells you. And uh, I think, just think that's so beautiful that that's like, you know, she's not just telling the servants that, she's telling all of us, like, do whatever he says. Um, and so what does Jesus tell the servants to do? Well, Jesus tells the servants to go to the jars and take water from them. Now, these jars were not just like little jars. Like, we think of little jugs, like water jugs, but they were these like big, like five feet jars that um, were used for ceremonial washing, it's, it specifies. So there were six stone water jars, um, and they contained from 20 to 30 gallons. Um, so this, this ceremonial washing that they did was washing of feet, and they would recycle this water. And so this was, again, third day in. Um, so this water had been recycled and um, was not fresh, was not new. Um, and so what did Jesus tell the servants to do? He tells them to go to the, to the jars and take water and bring them to the master of the banquet. And Mary had just told the servants, like, do whatever he says. And so the servants are like, well, I'm not going to get in trouble for this. They are, right? Um, and so the servants are like, yeah, we'll bring some foot water to the master of the, ser or master of the banquet, right? Um, and so they do. They take it. Um, to the, to the master and he does not realize where it had come from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. Um, then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. Um, so that what Jesus had did here, did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So Jesus takes this nasty, gross foot water and turns it into the best wine that I imagine anybody has ever had in the history of ever, um, because it's Jesus wine, right? Like he's not going to make something bad. Um, and I just think that this is such a beautiful like image of like what he does in our life all the time. Like he takes our sin and turns it into something good. He takes our bad situations and our painful situations and turns them into really beautiful things. Um, I'm excited to see what he's going to do with this whole corona coronavirus situation um, because I actually see already a lot of fruits that are coming out of it and I think you guys probably do too people stepping up and helping each other and, and doing good things um, that is inspiration from God right there that is inspiration from Jesus and it's it's beautiful to um, to get to watch that and that is what Jesus does he he takes the bad and turns it into to good um, but the really important line of this story is that um, Jesus says, my hour has not yet come to Mary. Um, 
Mary at this point actually goes and changes salvation history. Now, I don't know what was supposed to happen. I don't know when his time was supposed to come, but Mary's request actually is what changes, is what starts his public ministry. Um, and so when people say that she's just like a normal girl, um, well, she's not just a normal girl because her request like got this, um, got his whole ministry started. She's the one who brought about all of this. Um, she is the queen mother. And there's something really great about, um, about her because um, she's the queen mother. And so what she asks for, she's going to get. But because she was created without original sin, because she is pure um, in the most, like the most pure that you can be, um, she's not going to ask for anything that is evil. She's not going to ask for anything that's bad. She's not going to ask for anything that isn't good. Um, so she is the queen mother. Um, and another name for her is, she has a lot of names and you should look up some of them. They're really great. Um, but one of my favorites is the Ark of the New Covenant. Um, and we can really see some comparisons from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant to see how, why she would be called this. The Ark of the New Covenant, or the Old Covenant, carried three things. It carried the tablets with the Ten Commandments, the manna that came from heaven, and Aaron's staff, which was the symbol of the high priest. Mary, when she's pregnant with Jesus, carried Jesus, the word of God. She carried Jesus, who is the bread of life. And she carried Jesus, who is the high priest. She carried him in her womb. And that's why we can see this um, icon of her um, with, with Jesus in her, because he, he actually was in her. He was actually, she actually carried him in that way. Um, and then we also see these other symbols of, um, or similarities between the descriptions in the Ark of the Old Covenant and the Ark of the New Covenant and how some of these things like are very similar and how they, they kind of um, are supposed to call to mind back the, the Ark of the Old Covenant. We see that the presence of God would come upon the Ark and overshadow it. We see that in um, Exodus chapter 2, verse 14. And then um, with Mary, we see that um, when she's finding out that she's going to have Jesus, um, it says the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So it's the same language used. Um, the Ark of the Old Covenant, how can the Ark of the Lord ever come to me? Um, David says this. And then when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, Elizabeth says, why am I favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Um, in 2 Samuel 6, 17, it says, as the Ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael looked down and saw David leaping and dancing. And again, at the visitation, when Mary goes to Elizabeth, um, it's, she says, as soon as the sound of your Mary's greeting reached my ear, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And then, um, like again, in second Samuel six eleven, it says the Ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite for three months. And then Mary remained with Elizabeth for about three months. Um, we, we see so many similarities that are supposed to call to mind to these people who knew these stories so well and knew, understood like this is supposed to remind us of this because it's telling us something. It's trying to teach us something about Mary, um, that she is the Ark of the New Covenant. Um, and then if that's not enough for us to, we see in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, um, John is given this revelation and he, he goes back and tells the people what he saw from God. And he says, then God's temple in heaven was opened up and the Ark of the Covenant could be seen in the temple. Now, when he says this to the people, they had to be losing their minds because hundreds of years before, um, they actually lost the Ark of the Covenant. They actually lost it a couple of times, but they lost it kind of permanently, um, kind of permanently. Um, and they had been looking for it and craving it and wanting it back so badly. And so their reaction to hearing that, um, that he saw the Ark of the Covenant how, they had to have been like, this is amazing. Where is it? What does it look like? What shape is it? In? How can we get it? Like they had all these questions and we're so excited. Um, and he, like John just ignores all that. He just doesn't talk anything more about the Ark of the Covenant for a minute. And he says there was flashes of lightning, rumbles and peals of thunder and an earthquake and a violent hailstorm. And the people had to just been desperate to know, like, tell us more about the Ark. We want to know about the Ark. Um, and then he does. He goes on in, cha in chapter 12 and says, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Um, so he's actually naming Mary as the Ark of the Covenant in this time. And we can see later on when um, um, Juan Diego was given the image of Our, Our Lady of Guadalupe, um, this is the image that he was given. And it was a woman. Um, she was clothed by the sun, and you can see the sun around her. Um, with the moon under her feet, and you can see the moon there, um, because she 
is the Ark of the Covenant. Um, so the last two questions in the workbook that you guys don't have, but you can write them down if you want to. <laughs> um, it says, what do we mean when we say that Mary was assumed into heaven? So Richard talked a little bit about um, Jesus as, like being resurrected from the dead. Um, we're going to talk more later on about um, ascending into heaven and what that really means. But Mary was assumed into heaven, which means that she was brought body and soul from earth to heaven. Um, so this is different when Jesus ascended into heaven because he's the only one who's ever done that. Um, ascending means that he went in his own power. Um, Mary did not go to heaven by her own power. She was brought into heaven by Jesus's power. Um, there are several people in scripture who are mentioned as being assumed into heaven. Elijah is one. Enoch is another. Um, so we can look through scripture and see that like this is not just a one-time thing. This is something that um, that has happened before. And of course, if Elijah was worthy of um, being assumed into heaven because of his yes to God. The only thing, the only things at all that we know about Enoch was that he walked with God and, um, and that he was assumed into heaven. And so if that is what qualifies Enoch to, to be assumed into heaven, of course, Mary, um, was, you know, like had that too, because she walked with God in a more intimate way than ever, because she carried Jesus in her womb. Um, she raised him. She, she lived with him. Um, she was there at his crucifixion. Like, of course she was assumed into heaven. If we believe in assumption at all, we believe that Mary was assumed into heaven. Um, and then finally, we talk about praying to the saints and what, like, what does that really mean? Um, when we, we don't pray to saints in the way that we like, we don't worship saints, I guess is really what I'm trying to say. Um, we do talk to saints and we do ask for their intercession. Like we ask our friends to, to pray for us too. I ask my friends to pray for me all the time. I'm part of a prayer group of, um, of people from spirit of Christ who, uh, run the life team ministry. And we're always asking each other for prayers. Um, so it makes sense that we would be able to ask a saint for prayers too. Um, and if Mary, Mary is kind of like the saint of saints, like she's kind of our leader, um, in, in a lot of amazing ways. Um, and she's the, the role model for the saints. They, they want, they long to say yes to Jesus, um, in the similar way to the way that Mary did too. Um, I think that a lot of people have a hard time with Mary because they, they feel like giving her love and giving her attention is going to somehow take away from the love and attention that they should be giving to Jesus. Um, and, I think that that's a very, that comes from a very good place in their heart and it's a very um, important thing to address. But we, we look at the moon outside at night and it's a very beautiful thing. Whenever there's like a super moon or anything like that, like we all get really excited and we want to see it um, because the moon is beautiful, but the moon isn't beautiful because of anything that it is on its own. It's, be it's beautiful because of the way that it reflects the light from the sun. Um, if there was no sun, the moon would not be beautiful to us at all. And that's very similar to how Mary is too. Um, we love Mary because we love Jesus. Like we, he is the sun, he is the light. Um, he is the source of all goodness and life and everything. And he, she reflects him perfectly. Um, that's what we're all called to do. We're all called to reflect the light that Christ is in our lives um, so that the world can see that. And, um, and that makes us beautiful. Whenever we see something beautiful or good or holy in someone else, um, we are seeing the light from, from Jesus, from God. And, um, and so it's, it's proper, it's good to give her attention and to give her love. Um, she is, after all, Jesus's mom. And so we, it, it's good to, um, loving her is a way to love him. So that is, a long yet short um description of who mary is and what we believe um richard i'm unmuting you okay you are unmuted okay yes so that is all i have for tonight so if anybody has any questions we can go through that or if you want to email one of us, you can do that too. And we can, we will answer all your questions about anything you have. So <laughs> it's, it's important that if you do have questions that we address them. So that because our time is short and we want to make sure that we clear up anything that might be 
um, confusing to you. So let us know. Actually, that answered so many questions that I <laughs> just recently, um, you know, during the loss of my father and, and his family, it, they are not Catholic. And my Aunt Mary actually said to me, I said that I was thankful that my dad was able to see Mary, that he was with Mary. And she said, but she's just an average woman. He'll figure that out. And so, of course, I mean, this is my aunt. I couldn't say anything bad. I, so what I did is I ran to my mom and said, why did she say that? You know, and so my mom somewhat explained it to me, but this like completely answered the question. And now I could go chat with mom about it. So <laughs> that was great. And my husband just asked me about why does the apostle the Apostles' Creed say that Jesus uh, descended into hell. So on the break, I ran upstairs and explained that to him. <laughs> so this is good. Thank you. Um, are we going to meet next week, Richard, since we had planned to not meet because of spring break and now nobody <laughs> really allowed to go anywhere for spring break? Um, and by next and week, we might not be allowed behind. to leave our houses. <laughs> so, um, do you, are we going to meet next week? Is that is my whole question? Um, I want to say no, because we had already planned that in, but I want to say um, yes, too. But <laughs> I, I think that we should probably work out all of our technological things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We need the week to do that, so. Uh, well, uh, I don't know. I think we could stay on track if we don't. Okay. But it would be good to, to work out the technology. I, like we're okay. we're in a giant learning curve here. Just yeah. To, so like, we can to, you can say do no. We don't we amazing. don't have to meet next week. <laughs> but we'll look for an email though. Um, for the next class, it'll probably be. Hopefully, we can get the email out the the day before we do the meeting i'm not sure how zoom even works can we do that yeah okay and then we'll have our meeting on the the thursday okay and like i said we might next week we might not even be able to leave our houses so we'll see yeah <laughs> okay well you if you guys any have any other comments other questions, questions? Yeah, yeah you can always uh let us know now or you can email us and um we might just start our classes with like answering questions unless it fits in somehow we can fit it in but don't be afraid to email us <laughs> perfect i'm good i don't have any questions okay Sweet. well let's pray and then we'll be on our way <laughs> does that sound good in the name of the father <laughs> the son and the holy spirit amen amen father god thank you so much for all that you do and for all that you are and for the gift that Mary is to us and for the gift of um, this community. We ask that you can keep us all safe and healthy um, and that we can really um, just use this time, this very difficult and weird and challenging time to just bring you glory in whatever way that you want. Um, help us to say yes to you and to hear you. We love you so much. And Mary, please be with us in a special way as we say, Hail Mary, Amen. full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed Bless art thou among women, and women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Jesus. Holy Mary, Amen. Mother of God, God. pray for us sinners. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, for being here and taking your time out of your life. <laughs> you know, it was kind of funny. We... Um, plan to do this on the Zoom. We probably would have canceled the night because of the weather. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> worked out both ways. Yeah, yeah it's great. So, okay. I know people are kind of curious. Let me just one quick thing before we go. Let you go about whether or not we're going to have confirmation. <laughs> we don't know. Everything is so fluid right now. Um, it's there's a good chance we're not going to have an Easter vigil, and probably not not a good chance. There's a good chance we're not going to have um, 
official Easter Mass. We will stream it, though, from Spirit of Christ. So that's something we're trying to do right now. Um, but let's just stay fluid and go with how things are going. And the, we're, we're, the idea is to all stay healthy. So um, I'm, I'm good with that. <laughs> yep. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to end the meeting, and uh, okay. we'll see you guys soon. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.